We're going under the hood with Dr. Sunshine, where we explore topics that are relevant to STEM professionals with intersecting identities. Thank you for listening. Welcome everyone. We are back with another episode of Under the Hood. And today I have a very, very special near and dear guest with me, uh, Ms. Maggie Haraki, who we'll introduce in just a second. And just as a reminder, uh, Under the Hood is a brand new space for aspiring current or retired STEM students and professionals. Um, and it's also a space for the friends and family of those people where you can hear firsthand accounts about our behind the scenes experiences uh, in regard to how we've dedicated our lives to, to STEM. So with that, everyone, please welcome Maggie Haraki to the podcast. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Dr. Ivy. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad to be a part of this. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm very glad to have you. And just as an introduction, Maggie is a second year PhD student in the chemical engineering program at Stanford University. Very proud of her. She is exploring areas of research, focusing on area selective atomic layer deposition in Dr. Stacy Bent's research group. She graduated with top honors from the University of California, Riverside in 2020 with a BS in chemical engineering. As an undergraduate researcher uh, in Professor Jin Yong Liu's research lab at UCR, she was awarded the Chancellor's Research Fellowship. Um, and this was for her work in chemical degradation of PFAS in aqueous film forming foam. She won a UCR mini grant that allowed her to present her work at the American Chemical Society Fall 2019 National Meeting in San Diego, California. And I believe she won an award, an award for, this, for this presentation. Upon completion of her graduate studies, she is looking forward to pursuing a career in research uh, at a national lab. And she's gonna maintain her focus in surface science. So that's a very impressive resume and guys, there's a whole lot more, <laughs> a lot more accomplishments, a lot more uh, uh, great things on Maggie's resume, but that's just a little bit about her. So thanks again, Maggie, for being here. Okay. So happy to be here. Yeah. So just as a little bit of a background, uh, Maggie was in my first course I taught as a tenure track professor in fall 2018. CHE 100, chemical engineering thermo. Fun times, right? <laughs> okay. And so with that, we're going to jump right into our conversation about applying for graduate school. And I invited Maggie here because every time I get ready to give advice about applying for graduate school, I always go back to my experiences with uh, writing for Maggie and um, watching her go through the graduate application process. And I was continually impressed. So we'll start out talking about Maggie's research journey. So uh, as a first question, uh, Maggie, so what motivated or inspired you to attend UCR for your undergraduate studies? And why did you choose chemical engineering for your major? So I grew up really close to UCR. I grew up um, Few miles away in Moreno Valley and I was fortunate enough to be in um, a couple programs as a middle school and high schooler that really just focused on going to UCR and um, taking like classes that they set up for us and all in preparation to set up a first generation um, student to attend college and when it came time to start applying for schools um, I knew, I knew I wanted to go to a four-year university. I knew I wanted to go get a degree. Um, I didn't know exactly where I wanted to go. And when it, decisions came out, I, um, I had like my list of decisions or list of universities that I got accepted to. Um, and I started making like a pro-con list. Like if I went to this university, will I have to pay? Will I, um, be away from home, how far is like the drive? Will I have a car? What will it be like? 
Will it be in a city that I've never heard of before? Um, so those are all decisions impacting or all factors impacting my decision. And so I decided to go to UCR because one, it was close to home. I had a great financial aid package that allowed me to live on campus, which um, in turn let me get to be a part of a lot of opportunities while I was a student at UCR, including research. Um, and just knowing I had like a campus that I was already comfortable with and many of my um, colleagues from high school also um, went to UCR. So just having that familiarity really um, inspired my decision and helped me choose UCR as a campus. And why did I choose chemical engineering? So I was really good at chemistry um, and my brother was in the middle of his mechanical engineering degree at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So he had like sort of a bias towards engineering um, and he's like, okay, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to do chemistry. And he goes, okay, well, if you do chemistry, you have to go to graduate school because um, a master's degree would really help you like advance in that field. And I was like, okay, awesome. I don't want to go to graduate school. He's like, okay, well, you can get a degree in chemical engineering and your job prospects will be a lot greater um, at, towards the end of it, towards the end of your degree. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So I majored in chemical engineering, not really knowing what it was or how, how it would impact me in the future. Um, but looking back at it now, it was probably one of the best decisions that I've ever made. Um, and looking back at it now, the statement that I said, I'd never go to graduate school. And here I am in a PhD program at Stanford pursuing a degree in higher education. So it full circle, which is great. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's always those full circle moments where we always say what we're not going to do, but indeed we end up doing it. <laughs> and with that, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, you said you are a first generation student, right? Yes. Yeah. And you've made incredible feats. So uh, the next question that I want to ask is, okay, you, you've decided to go to UCR, you've majored in chemical engineering, you had a very thriving undergraduate research experience at UCR. And so can you tell the listeners a little bit about why you decided to join Dr. Liu's lab and how you balanced research, coursework, and all your extracurricular activities? Yeah, so um, for those who are unfamiliar at UCR, the department is chemical and environmental engineering, which is really unique. Um, which is a really unique department. I believe there, it's one of four or five um, in the country, which is pretty great. And so, um, as I mentioned before, I didn't really know much about research or um, like engineering in general, but my sophomore year comes around and I already felt like I wasn't doing enough to be like competitive for either the job market or whatever I wanted to do after I earned my degree. Um, so, I think it's important to talk about how to get involved in research and also doing research. But the way that I got involved in my research was um, the Society of Women Engineers was hosting a research networking night that invited out uh, professors and graduate students to recruit for their labs. And so um, I visited a couple tables uh, talking to professors about their projects, about like what um, what they expect from an undergrad, the time commitment and um everything in between. And so this was my sophomore year. Uh, there was a table that had a graduate student that I, he was a TA for the intro to chemical and environmental engineering course that I took the year previous. And I saw him sitting at the table and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna walk up to this table and see what his research is all about. Um, so I walked up to the table and my mentor, Michael Bentel, he was uh, talking about his work in destroying perfluorinated chemicals in water. And I was intrigued. I was like, I ah, water research. That's awesome. That's something I want to do. Um, and I, at that meeting, I told him, Hey, I have no research experience. My resume was a few lines long. I didn't know. I didn't have any experience beyond like gen chem in the lab. 
Um, and I was essentially like straight up and said, you're going to have to teach me everything that I'm going to need to know. Um, and he took that on and he taught me everything that I need to know about research. Um, so joining the lab was very fruitful, um, continues to be very fruitful even to this day. Still have great connections with Mike and Dr. Liu, um, which is great. And the work that I did, I really enjoyed. So I worked on um, helping Mike with his project. And then I found greater interest and started to express that to Mike and Dr. Liu. Um, and we found opportunities on campus that I could apply to and start my doing my own project, which is uh, one of the ways that I won the Chancellor's Research Fellowship and then um, won the mini grant to go present my work at uh, the San Diego conference. So full another full circle, I think this is gonna be a full circle kind of podcast, but um, having trouble like balancing research coursework, I think, so sophomore year, um, I was actually on track to graduate in five. Um, graduating in five was not something that I wanted to do personally because I just wanted to get in and get out in four. Um, and that was just a decision I made on my own. And so I was taking a lot of classes at the time and taking more classes than was like recommended for me. But um, managing research and schoolwork and other extracurricular activities, um, I think like mental health is super important. So that was like also one of my priorities. I think what helped me the most was communication um, between my mentor and I and um, whether or not like, hey, I can't be in lab today. I have this going on. Um, and it never warranted like I never needed an excuse as to why I couldn't be in lab. I just, you know, it's better to tell someone like, hey, I can't do this. Um, my apologies um, than to leave them hanging. I think that's that was one of the great practices that I learned. Um, but yeah, no, I was never pressured to be in the lab doing work. I was there in the lab doing work because I wanted to be in the lab. Um, so that was one of the greatest things that I was a part of in my undergrad. So That's great. It's great to be in a supportive environment, especially your first experience in a lab, right? Yeah. yeah. It could pull you or push you away. Um, so um, I think you alluded to this. Uh, we talked about Dr. Michael Bentel uh, in terms of your mentor, your graduate mentor. And that leads me to my next question, obviously. Um, how important was having good mentorship um, in your success as an undergraduate researcher in the lab? And do you think this had an impact on your decision to go to grad school? Yeah, so having good mentorship is extremely important. Um, I've seen my colleagues just not have the same mentorship um, and they didn't um, didn't want to be in their labs for too long or didn't really feel connected to their mentors or the way their mentor um, mentored them. But on the contrary, um, Dr. Michael Ventel, uh, he earned his PhD. Eh? <laughs> um, he, him and I, like, as I mentioned earlier, like our communication was great. Um, I was able to like ask questions about the work, like what we were doing about the field, talk about like experiments with him. Um, and there's like no such thing as a dumb question, which I really love. Um, I would walk in there and be like, oh, like, why are we doing this if we already did this? And it's like, well, we, you know, like research is research. We need to be able to cover every angle. So no one comes um, no one comes at us like at a publication and says, oh, but, you know, you didn't do this. So um, I learned that. I learned how to like better my writing skills, how to communicate my work um, and data to not only my PI, but like the scientific community um, where like Mike would just sit with me and we would talk about how to better express um, something like in a paper or like in an abstract that I was writing or something or like a proposal or anything. Um, and even like presentations, like we would go through them and there's like, yes, you're saying it correctly, but there's better ways of saying it and better ways of um, making it easier for people to understand. So I think that was great. And that was extremely helpful um, for me personally. I grew a lot and I think a lot of my 
friends would definitely say that I like, like matured over the years, um, not only as like a student, but as like an adult being able to do different things that I learned from research. Um, this did make a significant impact on my decision to attend grad school. Uh, I asked for help all the time. I mean, I still do. Like, I hopefully one day want to be like someone to me that Mike was to me or still is to me. Like, I hope I have a little undergrad, not a little undergrad, I have an undergrad, an adult that I can mentor and someone that will look up to me and ask me for help. Um, and I can guide them and help them. And if I can't do that, I can ask other people um, to help me. Like I can redirect them to my resources. So um, if someone has gone through it and you trust them, they're a great resource. Um, and a great mentor directs you to someone else if they can't help you. So <laughs> wise words. And that theme comes up over and over in these conversations of having good mentorship. Yes. I think that's the key to success in this, in this, in this graduate school journey. And I love what everything you said, just said. So um, as a, a, to round out the conversation about your path for graduate research, when did you know, okay, this is the right path for me. I'm going to go into grad school. I want to do research and maybe industry and government is not right for me right now. So again, great mentorship. Um, had a conversation with Mike. He, I think he approached me one day and he was like, well, so what is it going to be graduate school or industry? Like, well, how, how do I like help you to reach your goals? Um, and we sat down and we had a conversation and I think it was just after that conversation, I was like, okay, like I just need to think about this and I need to weigh out like the pros and cons of the decisions that I'm going to make. Um, and obviously like this included like my family, my brother, um, my friends, like, you know, what are you going to do just, to, <laughs> just to see what, um, other people are planning to do. It's always good to hear everyone out. But so I think the summer between my junior and senior year, I had an internship and, um, I loved the internship, loved what I was doing, loved the people. It was great. Um, but afterwards, I was like, well, despite like this being so great, I'm not done learning yet. And I want to continue my education and I want to continue researching. Um, and I really just enjoyed doing lab work and finding out new things. So that was another thing that really inspired me to like, OK, you want to go to grad school. And then the decision came, well, do you want to pursue a master's degree or do you want to pursue a Ph.D.? And personally, I believe that pursuing a PhD would, um, I was like, if I'm going to go back to school, um, you're going to just pursue a PhD and, you know, go in for the long haul and get that over with. Um, and not necessarily get it over with because it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, um, which is what I've been learning. And I've just finished my first year here. So I also didn't really feel ready to enter, enter like industry and or like government work. Um, and like, I fortunately, my brother had a job at that time and he would tell me about his job too. And I'm like, well, yeah, that doesn't sound like it's for me quite yet. So graduate school was the path that I decided to pursue. So. Well, we're most certainly glad that you made that decision. <laughs> and I think I remember that summer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I remember the summer of your internship. Yeah, so, uh, and with that, uh, to the listeners, you guys can see that Maggie has made a very intentional decision to go to grad school. And I'm hoping that, I know she's going to give some really good tips in this next part of the conversation. So we're going to talk about the, the nuances and the important parts of choosing your graduate program which I haven't seen another human being that's as intentional as you were in finding your graduate program. So with that, uh, I would like to know, what were the top three factors that were important to you when you were choosing your graduate programs that you wanted to apply to? 
So when I started my graduate school search, I believe I just Googled top chemical engineering graduate programs in the, like, in the country. And you'll get like a bunch of Google searches. But for me specifically, I wanted to pursue a different field that I'm pursuing now. And so that greatly impacted the way that I was looking at programs. So not only was I looking at chemical engineering, but I was also looking at environmental engineering. Um, but one place that I started when I was looking at any school or any department was the research that the professors were doing. Um, and if I found, like if I found a professor and he was doing research that I really enjoyed, I wanted to see like the school, like how many people are doing the work that I wanted to do at that university. So for instance, like um, if, there was a, if there was a department that only had one professor doing the work that I wanted to do, that wasn't as good as another department or another school that had three or four professors that had work that I would be um, potentially interested in pursuing. So that was um, to sidetrack. An Excel sheet with everything on columns and all listed out really helps during your search. So these like research was a column and it had professors and it had their work and it had pros and cons of if I wanted to decide, like if I really like that group or if I did not. Um, another thing for me is, uh, as I mentioned before, like I went to school so close to where I grew up. And so location personally was a huge factor in deciding uh, graduate programs. Uh, for instance, like I've only ever lived in the West Coast my entire life. Um, in Southern California, we don't really have like rainy days. We, you know, it's usually in the hundreds, but if I decided to go to a school on the East Coast, I'm going to have to prepare for snowy days and um, I think tornadoes and hurricanes and all that. Um, that was just something that I was cautious of, but that wasn't going to 100% deter me from um, choosing a school, especially if I like the work, the professor, the research. Uh, also location, on the topic of location, getting to somewhere in the middle of, let me say, Nashville, not Nashville, Tennessee, getting somewhere in the middle of Tennessee, how many planes would I have to take to get there? Um, if I had an emergency or if my family had an emergency, how how much would it cost me to fly over back to California? How much would it cost them um, to travel over there just to see me? And so that was another huge uh, factor in my decision making. Um, another one was the voices of graduate students in a program. Are the, are the graduate students vocal? Like, do they have a say in what's going on in the department? Do they have a say in the curriculum? Do they have a say in um, anything that you would think is out of their controls? And this is something that you don't really find out until you have those um, department interviews when you get into a program or just like pre-interviews, which we'll, I know we'll discuss later. But um, that was another factor that I really looked into. Um, and then I think another thing would be like job perspectives afterwards. If I went to a university that, um, for instance, one of my friends went to a university in um, the mid the middle of the country, or we're just going to say, because <laughs> the middle of the country and their university fed into like Chevron. Well, if I go to that university, will I be working at Chevron afterwards? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But just job perspectives afterwards is super, super important in decision making. Um, you'll have your university posted on your degree. And many people do look at that when they're um, looking for jobs. But I mean, it's not what your degree or what university you went to, it's what you did during your time at that school. So I think that's very important, regardless of where you go um, and who you work with. It's it's what you did, not what everyone else did. So incredibly insightful information. Absolutely. And I hope that's helpful to the listeners. So you've wound up in a really good program. So I would take her advice. <laughs> okay. And so the next thing I want to ask you about is about 
how many programs is appropriate to be looking into when you're trying to decide because you could oversaturate, you could like spread yourself too thin or you could be too narrow. So about how many schools should students be looking at? Um, so at the beginning of your search, it's normal to just be overwhelmed by the amount of schools that you want to look at. Um, and that's OK. I think I probably looked at over 30, 40 schools and then I just started knocking them off, um, like knocking them off a list. But I think to seriously consider for me uh, is like no less than seven, but no greater than 12. So because I had such a great relationship with my mentor, we, we kind of made this into a game and we only made it into a game to like calm my anxiety about applying to universities. So we made a list. And on this list, we had my safety schools, my maybe schools, and my dream schools. Um, and I think my safety schools had like five of them. And it's like, okay, yeah, you're a great candidate for this university. Like you would probably get in um, just with your extracurriculars, your GPA and everything else, like your research background, I think, you know. And then we're maybe it's like, oh, okay, you know, these are a little, little out there. And then my dream schools were like, okay, well, you know, if you get into these schools, then, then you've made it. Like those are your dream schools. So we made it into a game. We, you know, marked it all up, put it in an envelope and hit it away. Um, that helped me because not only did it help me narrow down the list, but um, I was very motivated to do my best on my applications, which helped. Another thing was when I did make that list, I showed it to my mentor and I also showed it to my PI. And they helped me narrow it down even further. Because I think when I gave it to them, it had about 20 on there. And they're like, yeah, no, that's one too much. And two, you have to consider your letter of recommendation writers. Um, they probably also don't want to be sending out 20 different letters of rec to 20 different submission portals at 20 different deadlines. So it's very important to not only consider the people you're working with, like your community within, but also... Um, your letter of recommendation writers because they're busy and um, they have other things and other deadlines going on. But yeah, so seven, no less than seven, no greater than 12. Um, and look, make a pros and cons list. A pros and cons list, like some of the things on my pros and cons list were like the location, the size of the department. Was it huge? Was it small? How many faculty members did it have? Um, another thing that I looked at that people are very interested in is like, how many female faculty do they have? How many people of color do they have? Um, like, like how inclusive is a school? How, um, how supportive of different groups are we? And so different things that I took into consideration. Also, um, the research areas were on this group, were on this list as well. So just a lot of things. The rule of thumb is no less than seven, no greater than 12. I think that's good for our engineering students out there that need numbers. <laughs> yeah, no, congrats on making that good decision. So uh, the next thing I wanna ask you is, okay, you've narrowed down your list of schools and programs. So did you reach out to anyone at the institutions, the PI, the grad students, um, when you were uh, deciding which, once you narrowed it down, did you reach out to anyone for advice? Yeah. Uh, so personally, when, when I narrowed down my list, I did not reach out to anyone. Um, only because application season is so close to final season and a holiday break and all that, where I just didn't, want to reach out to people um and that was like a personal choice that I made but if that will encourage you to apply to a university I definitely think you should um I I looking back at it now I do wish that I reached out to a couple people in groups that I was interested in and said hey can we just have like a coffee chat can we um not even a coffee chat like can we just email back and forth and can I just ask you about your experiences in this group um I think that would have helped me maybe even narrow down my list even more and not apply to a university if I had uh, conversations before I even applied to a school. Um, but 
reaching out to people at like these institutions there it's important but it's not necessary um it just happens to be your personal preference so wonderful yeah and so uh, as a last question about uh choosing programs i'm interested in knowing do you have any caveats or uh, best practices about what students should not use or what are the parameters they should not consider when choosing a grad graduate program, right? So for instance, is this a party city or like what's, what should they not be looking at? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the major things is like financial aid package. You shouldn't be like, I don't think a financial aid package should deter you or not deter you, especially because if you apply to a school in California versus a school in, let's say, Wyoming, um, your financial aid package is probably going to be a lot greater in California. But um, a great thing to remember is that like our stipends are based off the cost of living. Um, and if they are offering you more money, that means the cost of living is probably a lot more for that university. So I think that's one thing that's like, don't that's you shouldn't be choosing a graduate program based off a financial aid package um you shouldn't be choosing a graduate program uh based off if your friend is going there or not um connections are great you will make a lot of friends a lot of connections and graduate school networking is something is a skill that is learned um and it goes a long way so i don't think Having a friend there is great, but that shouldn't be part of your decision. And also another thing would be one project, one PI. Um, if you are looking at a program that only has, that has one PI that you're like, you really wanna work with. And that one PI after you've had great conversations with them only has one project. Um, unless you have it set in stone in writing on a contract that you're in their group, do not choose to go to university that like you're putting all your eggs in one basket because um, I've heard a lot of stories where that's just not the case because you don't know what other people are doing as well. You don't know the connections that other people have with these professors, these um, the projects, their backgrounds, their history, their story. Everyone's story is different. Um, so I think that's another thing like don't don't choose a don't choose a school based off of one thing one person so yeah excellent yeah thank you for those candid uh tips about uh kind of things that you shouldn't really weigh too heavily when you're uh, 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 choosing a grad program and so with that in mind uh the student has found the list of schools they want to go to now is the hard work right yeah. applying for the program okay and so this next question is about uh, timing. So it's, it's about to be application season. So when exactly should students start beginning their applications and how long do you think they should set aside to complete their seven to 12 applications? Um, yesterday, <laughs> they, should, <laughs> they should start as soon as possible. Uh, I think that's one thing that I would stress, start the application process. If you, you have your list, you have your schools, start the application process as soon as possible. And what this looks like and what really helped me was I made an Excel sheet. Excel and I are very great friends. Um, and you also have to remember like Excel is a workbook, make Excel like for you. Don't make it for someone else. Don't make it like pleasant for their eyes. Make it for you. If you have to put X's and Y's somewhere, put those X's and Y's somewhere. But make an Excel sheet that'll keep track of your usernames, your password, the email address you've been using, um, security question answers. Yeah, like all this stuff should just be in one central location so you always have access to it. And then make an Excel sheet of what the program is asking from you. So is it asking you for two personal statements? Is it asking you for a resume and a cover letter or just a cover letter? Um, put the deadline of when that application is due. Uh, as I mentioned, like West Coast schools have different deadlines than East Coast schools. So students on, who are living on the West Coast have to adhere to East Coast times. Um, so it's not 5 p.m. Pacific time, it's 2 p.m. Pacific time. And those are 
those are things that need to be communicated to your letter writers as well. So it's important to know how many letters of recommendations um, these programs want. What's also important is making sure your personal statements or your research proposal is uh, follows like the specific requirements for that application. Um, and most of these just have them, or most of these programs have them already laid out for how your um, personal statement should look, what size font, what type of um, what type of font, what the spacing is supposed to be, um, any headers they want. So just make sure you follow the rules um, for your application. So it's like not disqualified before it's even looked at. Um, and I think if, if you follow all that, that'll, it'll set you on a good track to um, making your statements great. So and making your application great. Yeah, so much like the NSF proposal that we talked about last week or in the last episode, uh, there's essays, there's letters of reg resumes and such. So you have to put aside some time for that as well. Um, and then finally about the application process, is it free? <laughs> How much does it cost to apply to grad school? And if there were, if the costs were high for you, how did you mitigate those? Um, so fortunately, unfortunately, graduate school applications are not free. Uh, well, the majority of them, let me just say, they're not free. They And they are costly. I think the average one is about $60, which is, which actually does like start causing like a financial burden when you are looking at seven to 12 programs. Um, but a great tip that I think should be for anything is like if something is a financial burden asking for help or even just like sending an email and saying hey this is not um, something that I can do at the moment like is there any way that the, your university can help me out like do they have resources for this type of problem um, it's not a problem but like for this type of situation so like the cost of applying should never deter you from actually applying to the program but um I think one great tip would be like to read through the instructions on the graduate program, like their homepage. And if you don't find anything, there's usually like a point of contact that you can go and reach in the department and they may be able to talk to you. Uh, they may ask you like, oh, what professor are you interested in and start a conversation there. And, you know, there's a lot of things that um, could be done in that in that way. Um, and if Applying to grad school, if it is a financial burden, there are no ways to mitigate that. Um, just make sure you have that list. Have that list of programs that you just like you have, like you want to apply to. That like, there's no way that you can, you know, sleep another night without applying to this university. Um, and would seriously consider attending. So if there's schools that you want to apply to, but you know, you're like, well, it, it snows in February, and you wouldn't really consider attending, then don't apply to it, um, especially if cost is uh, one like cost is an impacting factor. So this is great. And um, just as a side note, I have even considered trying to help a student out if they're trying to join my program, and I really want them to join my lab. Uh, I've tried to find ways to help alleviate the grads, the application costs. So. That's a good segue into talking about financial aid and actually going to grad school and how much it costs. So not everybody realizes or understands the, the finances behind getting your PhD. And I just want to let people know this podcast is really about going to graduate school for your PhD, not necessarily your master's. So Maggie, is grad school free? <laughs> and should, should students uh, be prepared to spend more money on their graduate education? Um, so the STEM field, I know mostly about STEM, Grad, graduate school for your PhD is basically free. Um, you're getting paid to go to school, um, and this payment comes in a form of a stipend. So the stipend covers your tuition. So that's money that you never see because it goes directly to, back to the university. Um, and that stipend also covers your living expenses. So Stanford, um, like the Stanford Chemical Engineering Department will pay me a stipend, uh, each year that's already set before the next year. And um, that covers my living expenses. So 
you know, just like, just like a job, you get paid biweekly and you get, um, like that's, that's the money you get to live off of and start earning search doing for doing research and earning your PhD. Um, and typically your first year of grad school, you are taking classes. So you're taking classes, you're getting paid to do your research, you're getting paid to take classes, um, and to live. Um, also some programs offer the students free or subsidized like healthcare. So that's another thing that should be considered, um, when you, when you are looking, but, um, to be completely honest, like the stipend that I have at Stanford, like I, I can live comfortably off my stipend at Stanford. So that's, um, that's a, like a, a pro for me, which is really nice. Um, yeah. So graduate school is free. <laughs> that's right. But, mm-hmm. Yeah. And no, I was just going to say, but that doesn't mean, um, I think we're like, we're going to talk about this later, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply for other things like the NSF GRFP as discussed in the earlier episode. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I'll just go ahead and put it out there. The, the ranking of the school kind of decides your stipend a little bit. It depends on if you're at a public school or a private school. Um, <laughs> we can go under the hood about that a little bit later. Um, so speaking about, these competitive uh, stipends and going to a high ranking school, how important is a really good GPA when it comes to getting or being considered first for these topper fellowships, these additional fellowships at your graduate program? Uh, So personally, I think your GPA is important. Um, So that doesn't mean you should slack off in your classes or anything, but your extracurriculars and your research have a huge impact um they can they can help the committee that's looking over your application determine whether or not like you're a well-rounded individual because your gpa doesn't speak for everything um they would love someone who is textbook smart but they would also love someone who is inspired to go and change the world who's inspired in their research who's who wants to do not only what's best for them but for um their their group mates, their community, the like the greater good of the people. Um, so your GPA is, it is considered, but what you do for others um, is also considered and like your impact on society is so important. Um, especially like if you're a first generation student like myself, there's not many first generation students who are inspired to go to, uh, or to pursue a higher education, like a PhD, because they, they just don't feel welcomed in that space. And I mean, like for me personally, one of those goals is to inspire first generation students to say like, Hey, not only am I here and I'm like doing it, but I can also help you in um, your endeavors because it, it is a struggle. Um, a struggle that not many people know about, but a struggle hopefully that one day is mitigated um, in the near future. And they they look at things like that. They look at what you're doing. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your candor about the first gen experience. A lot of our listeners um, will uh, appreciate this episode because that's a very important perspective in 2021 and maybe one we don't hear from too much. And so to round out the discussion about um, financial aid and applications, you've got five, 10 offers in your hand, okay? Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through making your decision and how you evaluated where you wanted to go to grad school? So five to 10 offers in your hand. Um, So I think what I first did was uh, start looking at the cost of living in places. I, you know... To be completely honest, I grew up in an area where like the nearest Whole Foods was 40, 50 minutes away. Um, Coming to Stanford, living in Palo Alto, there's a Whole Foods, like there's a Starbucks every corner. Um, So that's like one thing that you have to consider. Um, So cost of living. So you got to see what the cost of living is, where you want to go with your financial aid package. You have to see um, whether or not that university offers on-campus housing. Um, Stanford University has on-campus housing for 
90% of Stanford students actually live on campus because the cost of living outside of campus is so high that like our stipends would have to be significantly higher to, um, to fulfill those. So you have to also consider that. So when you're looking at university, does that university offer on-campus housing for their students? Because on-campus houses housing is usually subsidized um, or will you have to go find an apartment off campus? Um, and that comes with additional costs. Like, is it gonna be furnished? Is it not gonna be furnished? Does, do you have a water bill to take, like worry about? Do you have Wi-Fi? So that's all coming out of your stipend that you just have to really consider and really just be, I mean, be an adult about, I think. Um, and so that was one thing. Uh, another thing for me, as I mentioned, like first gen student, like my parents uh, wanted to be, didn't want to be too far away from home, but wanted to be close enough. Like if anything happened, um, will my stipend be able to get me home? So will I have to pay $500 to fly home for Christmas, five, $600 to fly home for Christmas or with a holiday break? Um, and then how many flights will I have to take to get to the middle of somewhere? And, you know, will I enjoy that experience? And so that was another thing that I really considered. Um, another thing was, was another thing that I considered financial aid packages. Oh, um, when, you, when you, you know, when you're an adult, you have to start cooking for yourself. So like the cost of groceries, this goes back to like the whole foods discussion. Um, the cost of groceries, like clearly like going to whole foods is going to cost you more than um, going to like Safeway or State of Brothers, or I only know Southern California stores, but um, so things like that, like how, what is it going to cost you? Um, transportation. Do you need a car? where you're going to live. Uh, yes, you can Uber, yes, you can Lyft, but do they have an established transportation system or do you need to have your own mode of transportation to get places? Um, and these are all things like you have to consider in your stipend, like, well, how much money do I have to set aside for transportation? Um, if I do take my car, what if uh, I blow a tire and I have to take it to a machine shop? What if I need an oil change? These are all just, things that are adding on um, that are just deducted like from your from your stipend. Um, but yeah, but at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, you have to really sit down and budget your stipend. Um, don't choose the stipend that just because you see more money means it's um, the better option. All of our stipends are taxed. So everything is um, Everything is taxed, which is super important to remember. So you don't have, you technically don't have that full amount of money. Um, you have to consider taking out taxes for that. So it's just a lot of uh, decisions and a lot of decisions that you have to personally make to see like what will make you happiest on where you decide to go. So wonderfully stated. And just the thing to remember, everyone. There are some personal sacrifices you have to make because the, the stipends, while generous in some places, may not be so generous in other places. And just full disclosure, my graduate stipend was $2,000 a month <laughs> in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, uh, fortunately, I had a topper fellowship in the last three years of my uh, grad school experience but it was still tight. <laughs> and so I worked a little bit on the side. I don't recommend that for everyone. So I think you've done a good job uh, explaining how to budget all of those things that you just don't anticipate like getting a flat tire. Okay. Yeah. And also I think another thing would be medical bills. Um, I think that's not something I brought up. Fortunately, Stanford does have like an emergency fund for um, their students. But if you're someone who unfortunately um, has a lot of medical issues and, you know, co-pays and all that, um, really look into the program and see what their health care does provide you with and what their, um, and if there are any emergency funds that you can um, ask for money for and do all that. So medical, medical issues are also another thing that are super high up there. That's right. We're still humans at the end of the day, right? <laughs> 
So take care of yourself now so that you can thrive in grad school. <laughs> and with that, we're going to go a little bit under the hood. And I just want to just get some candid uh, advice from you, Maggie. Um, so you've gone through this process. Obviously, you've been successful. Is there any part of this finding a program, applying for grad school that you do differently? And if so, why? Yeah, so I think the first part, applying to a program, um, I would start earlier. The earlier, the better. As I mentioned, start yesterday. Um, it is super important to start early. I cannot stress that enough. Um, and I like, to be completely honest, I was doing applications to the minute that they were due. Um, I kind of like, I'm a perfectionist. Everything just has to be in line and order. Like, and you sit there and you really think about the statement on their on their application process. And it's like, well, did they want like everything in 10 point font or did they just want the record, like the references and you just start to overthink things? Um, I don't recommend that. But starting earlier helps you get done earlier. It also helps the people who are helping you um, start looking at things. Um, you're not rushing them. You're like, hey, I need this like right now. They, it gives you some time to for them to start looking over it um, and really give give you their honest feedback about the work that you've like submitted to them. Um, also, I know some people have like I struggle to write, but what I've found really helpful is just opening up like the Google Docs um, and just writing like little little sentences here and there and just going back and you know mending them. Like my first draft doesn't have to be my final draft, which is pretty awesome. Um, and after you get into programs, another thing that I would, uh, something that I would do differently is talk to the professors whose work like doesn't interest you because I mean, yeah, so it might, that, that might be a weird thing to say. Um, but hear me out. I, I came to grad school with one focus. I was like, I'm going to do this type of research. Um, I'm not doing that type of research right now. I'm in a group that I'm like so fond of right now that I wish that I had started talking to my professor earlier and getting to know this group a lot, um, getting to know this group from the beginning. But um, I think that's super important because even if you don't join a group, you start making connections with professors. Like, hey, do you remember I had a conversation with you? We had we talked about this. And also remember, like, professors are humans, too. You don't have to just talk about research or their school or this. You can talk to them about, like, the baseball game that happened. Or you can talk to them about um, anything, like food. What What's your favorite restaurant downtown? Where do, you, like, where do you guys hang out? You know, <laughs> don't ask your professor where you hang out. But just stuff like that. Um and most of them are just like so excited to not be talking about work that they would just love and, you know, have that conversation with you. And that's how you get people to remember you. Um, and I think that's super important to for not only like your career, but um, just to build genuine connections with people. So start your applications early and start talking to people that you really you might not even see yourself working with, but you end up working with them. And it's just it turns out everything for the best. So, yeah. I really love that advice, Maggie. Also, talking to people outside of your uh, field of vision can also be helpful because you may find a mentor outside of your field, right? Yes, 100%. I agree. You may find an advocate outside of your field. Um, and with that, I want to ask another question. So you've been in grad school for about a year. You're starting your second year. Is there anything that has happened so far that you didn't expect? that you probably want to warn other students about or you're ex pleasantly surprised about? Um, so I like I joined a field, no idea what I was doing. Um, I even communicated that with my my PI and I was like, I don't even know what any of this is, but it sounds cool and I'm sitting here and I'm willing to learn. Um, and she was like, yeah, definitely. I don't expect most people to come in here knowing what we do, um, which is great because many PIs aren't that receptive. Um, and that's another thing that I really like about my PI, how receptive she is and how um, encouraging she is in 
working um, with her newer students. Um, and also that my PI is a female in the STEM field, just rocking it out there. Um, but for me, anything that was unexpected, um, I kind of knew that learning atomic layer deposition was going to be difficult and is difficult. So I'll be doing experiments and something won't work out too well. Um, and I would sit there and I would get really frustrated and my lab mates would be like, Maggie, like, it's, it's okay. Um, you've been here for four or five months in the group. And they're like, you're still learning and that is okay. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to like talk to us about what's going on. Um, because no one expects you to be perfect straight out of the gates. So I think that's one thing that um, I'm still learning that it's okay to fail because I mean, that's, that's what makes a researcher a researcher and that's what makes a grad student stay in their PhD for five years. Um, not everything's gonna work out. And because not everything's gonna work out, you are going to be putting in um, time and effort for reading papers and redoing experiments and making sure that um, the data that you're getting is genuine and like comparable data that could be distributed out to the scientific community. Um, Cause at the end of the day, like you want to make a difference with the work that you're doing. So I think um, that's something that like, I didn't expect, I didn't expect to come here and like my experiments not to work. Um, I was like, I want all my experiments to work. Yeah, no, um, I've done a lot of experiments and it's, it's, it's been a good, uh, it's been a good run and I'm so excited to keep running this marathon and, you know, slow down on my sprint. So <laughs> wonderful that's wonderful uh and, and very honest and it's very uh forthcoming for people that are coming into grad school as perfectionists most of us are perfectionists and it really tempers our expectations right so yeah. thank you for sharing that thank you and last but not least i want to round out the conversation and ask if you have any more or any final words of encouragement advice for our first generation first generation listeners about applying to grad school. Yeah. Um, so do not be afraid to ask for help. Um, I am still asking for help. I ask for help almost every single day. Um, and that could be help in, in any which way. Like, I asked for help on, um, I mean, what's the most, I don't even know, but I asked for help. I asked for so much help and it's okay because the worst thing that someone can say is no. And if someone isn't willing to help you, that that's okay. Everyone has um, their own goals and stuff. But if you're afraid to ask someone for help, if you're afraid to voice your concerns or voice your opinions, um, that might not be the right community for you. Uh, so you may have to start looking outside of that community. Um, but personally, I wouldn't have made it to where I am without asking for help. Like as Dr. Ivy mentioned, um, like the first, I remember meeting her for the first time in Thermo, but like going into her office and saying, hi, like, how are you a professor? And we, she pulled out her laptop and was like, um, do you have time? And we sat there and we went through all of like all of her background and we I just learned so much about Dr. Ivy and how um, she's a successful woman in STEM and at UCR teaching us chemical engineering like this was you know I didn't grow up with those influences or those mentors and just like finding a mentor in Dr. Ivy um, just like by even going up to her and saying hi how did you do this and um, she was willing to sit there and have that conversation with me. Um, another thing would be your parents, your family, your friends, they, they want to, they want to understand what you're doing. They may never, they may never understand what you're doing, especially the research, um, especially why you want to go to grad school. And I think it's important, especially for first generation students to really hold your ground and really say like, this is what I want to do. This is how it will help me in the future. Um, I think the first thing my dad asked me when I said, hey, I want to go to grad school, he goes, how much is this going to cost me? Because this isn't something that he was familiar with. Um, and after I told him that it was like grad school is paid for and I get a stipend and all this, 
he was more on board, not that he wasn't before, but he was super um, like, how could I help? You know, how could I get you to help, like to your goals even more than he was before, um, which was great. But it might take more than one explanation to your family on why you're making the decisions you're going to make. Why are you going to move away from home for five years when you've been like a steady in that home or a constant in the home? Um, many first generation students don't leave home which is um, which is kind of sad, but um, I know a lot of people rely on family and family's super important. So um, yeah. And then I think the last thing is um, make connections with people. Like if you know, if you know what grad school, like if you know you want to come to grad school and do something, like make connections with someone, make connections with a professor, have them mentor you. Um, especially if uh, you're an undergrad watching this and you're in your sophomore or junior year and you know grad school is what you want to do, I would say go to your favorite professor, or go to a professor that you really respect, or a professor whose work that really inspires you and say, hey. Um, well, I mean, you are a professor, so you probably did go through this graduate school uh, process. Would you would you mind mentoring me? There's no shame in asking someone to say like, hey, would you mentor me? Um, and if they don't have time for that, they'll I mean, most great mentors will put you in contact with someone who would. So that's super important. And for you to be a competitive applicant and go to your dream school. So I think uh, I think that's all the things that I've learned as a, as a first generation graduate student, it's not easy. Um, I don't see it getting easier anytime soon, but it's rewarding and I'm learning and I'm here to learn. And that's what I signed up for. So, yeah. Deeply inspiring, deeply inspiring. Uh, Maggie, uh, as someone who is about maybe 10 years my junior, you you just continue to inspire me. Um, you're great, your tenacity, your, uh, your visionary thinking. And I think what you've said today will help a lot of, a lot of students that uh, share your similar background. And um, you're gonna do great things. And I, I appreciate you spending this time and giving the behind the scenes, some behind the scenes advice about how you got to where you are. Um, Stanford University is the number one program for environmental engineering. I'm not sure about chemical. Do you know? Yeah. I don't. We're, I don't know. We're tied, we're tied with it's, it's up there. Yeah, it's up there, guys. <laughs> um, and with that, um, I want to thank Maggie for her time. And thank you guys for listening. This has been episode six of Under the Hood. And we'll talk to you next time.